and you're else just logging in. Oh, right. Hi, uh, Danny. How are you? Good, Tim. Good. Yeah, that's good. So Narelle's coming as well as she. She'll be in yes. The, yeah, right. Yeah. Did you either of you have any questions or you know anything in relation to conflict you wanted to pass by me before we sort of launched into the topic today? No, I don't. I no, not at this point, Tim. No. All good. Yeah. Okay. Danny, nothing from you. No. 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 All right. Um, so, look, I'll put up the slides and we'll get launching. And when Narelle comes in, I'll obviously let her in. So I'll just share my screen. Okay. All right. So um, let's have a look at where, what, where we've come from and where we're going. So look, today I, I wanted to talk about this idea of assertion or being assertive and the difference between that and being, here we go, I think Narelle's in now, uh, and the difference between being aggressive and passive. And I just wanted to touch on those today. That's our main topic. Hi, Narelle. G'day. We've just started, all good. Um, just when we looked at unit one, we uh, we had the the profile to do. As you might recall, there were the five different approaches to dealing with conflict or negotiation, depending on what you, what you want to refer to it as. And the whole purpose of that was to give you a sense of what your preferred style was, if you like, and to try to be fairly flexible and not just continue to use that style. That That was pretty much what unit one was all about. And then in unit two, we looked at people and their personalities and ultimately how different personalities, generally speaking, like to deal with conflict and that they are generalizations. It's not always the case, but hopefully that gave you some sense of maybe some of the people you're working with and the way they might approach conflict and how they go about those sorts of things. And last time we met two weeks ago, and it was an important topic, is this whole notion of being able to manage your own emotions and your own emotional reaction. Because normally it's an unpleasant feeling when you've got to deal with conflict. And sometimes that unpleasant feeling leads to us avoiding conflict on the one hand, or on the other hand, lashing out and being quite aggressive. And both of those approaches may not be ideal. And that's what leads us into the next topic, which is around this notion of being assertive rather than aggressive or passive. And I'm going to talk about that pretty much during the session. So just jump in at any time. If you've got a comment to make or a question to make, a question to ask, then go for your life and we'll see what we can do with that. So I want to, first of all, define what assertion is because a lot of people have a misunderstanding about it and see assertion and mix it up with aggression and it's not anything like aggression but I want to explain where it sits between passive and aggressive so it's in between there actually I want to share some case studies with you and perhaps get your participation around how you might deal with it which would be the best way to go to deal with the problem that I'm going to present you. And then I'm going to finish up talking about a model that is very, very effective and something you can start using virtually this afternoon, which is the SBI model. And I'll explain that in a bit more detail when we get to that later on in the presentation. So essentially that's what we're doing in this session today. So let's launch into a definition around assertion. Now, this is my definition, and I'm sure if you Googled assertion or assertiveness or even assertive, you'll get a bunch of different kind of uh, definitions. But I think this one pretty much covers it. And that is an honest and direct and appropriate expression of one's feelings, thoughts and beliefs. And the way I like to look at it is that assertion, if, if you think about it, this on the continuum, at one end, we've got passive. That's where you let other people walk all over you. 
And then at the other end of the continuum, we have aggression, where basically what you're trying to do is to walk all over the other person. Now, both of those approaches are not necessarily good when we're dealing with conflict for, for a variety of reasons. But in the middle, there's this concept of assertion, which I wanted to cover a little bit with you today. And assertions in the middle, because in assertion, you're not backing down. But then on the other hand, you're not being aggressive either. It's that very moderate, firm approach where it's still respectful to the other person. And so it's really smack bang in the middle. And I think when we talk about, you know, assertion, when we're talking about human beings, in the very first instance, we were the only thing that human beings had to concern themselves about was being attacked by a wild animal. They had no taxes to pay. They had no, you know, they, they, they really, it was a very uncomplicated life. And all they had to worry about is how they would manage the real potential to be attacked by a wild animal. And ultimately, there was only two ways that you can approach that. You can either run away from the animal or you can fight the animal. And there was nothing in between. It was only sort of two choices that you really had. So, for example, if the animal was quite slow, then it would be quite possible to run away. And that would be the sensible thing to do. But if, on the other hand, the animal is quite quick, then running away is not going to work. So perhaps we should attack fight fire with fire, in other words. So this is what psychologists call the flight or fight response. And of course, our primitive brain, we've still got a part in our brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala actually processes things first at the first blush of any conflict. The amygdala decides or tries to make a decision, should I run away from this or should I fight it? And the problem, of course, is that now living in the 21st century, uh, we're not likely to be attacked by a wild animal, but there are a whole lot of other things that can actually occur, which make our world a whole lot more complex and sophisticated. So in other words, dealing with things by using to flight or fight is no longer relevant. So that's where this assertion idea comes in. And so, you know, to be able to act assertively, in my view, is the is pretty much the essence of being able to manage conflict effectively. So let's have a look at it a bit more. So I think if I defined assertion a bit more, I would be saying this to you that when you're acting assertively, what you're doing is you're you're actually looking after your own needs. And that is perhaps a need to be heard a need not to be walked on, a need to stand up to aggressive behaviour. So there's, so assertion is actually protecting your own rights. But on the other hand, it's also protecting the rights of the other person. So yelling and screaming at the other person is actually going beyond your rights because the other person doesn't deserve to be yelled and screamed at just as you don't. So... Assertions that middle ground where you're basically saying, I have rights, you have rights, and we're going to deal with this accordingly. But if you're going to deal with something passively, you're basically saying, you have more rights than me. So therefore, I'm going to be a doormat and you can walk all over me. On the other hand, when you're acting aggressively on the other end of the continuum, you're basically saying, I have more rights than you. That's when people are acting aggressively, that's what they're basically saying in, a, in you know, by their own deeds and words. That I have more rights than you. Now, if you approach someone on the basis of I have more rights than you, then clearly they're not going to be happy. You might win the argument, but certainly you'll have a price to pay for that because the other person is not going to be happy with you because they didn't appreciate you being so aggressive with them. But interesting enough, on the other hand, if you allow people to walk all over you, that is act, a pass act passively, then you're only really going to train people to continue 
that behavior. So what will happen is that you will continue to encourage them to basically bully you. And I find this a lot when you talk to people that, are, that, are, that you know, act as, uh, quite passively a lot of the time, they'll often feel very hard done by and often say to me if I'm coaching them or whatever, why is it I'm such a nice person, I'm willing to give my way, why is it people will kind of use that too much? And the answer, of course, is in the mirror, because what the person's doing is training the other person to act like that, you see. So both of those, being aggressive or passive, are actually not helpful when we're trying to communicate with someone else. In fact, there are very, very few examples where I'd say being aggressive or passive is actually a good response. So the key is if we're protecting our rights and we're protecting the rights of the other person or, or at least honoring those rights, then what's actually, that's to me is the ultimate essence of assertion. Let me give you a practical example. Let's say that you're talking to someone in a meeting and that person interrupts you mid sentence and you hadn't finished what you were saying. It would be perfectly valid for you to say to that person, excuse me, let me just finish what I'm saying before you say what you're going to say. Now, by doing that, I'm protecting my rights, but I'm also being courteous enough with the other person to acknowledge that they have rights as well. Now, in that same circumstance, if I was acting aggressively, what I would probably do is I would probably, as soon as they interrupted me, I'd probably start raising my voice and getting very angry and saying, how dare you interrupt me? You're a rude person, blah, blah, blah. Now, if I did that, what I'm doing is I'm acting aggressively because what I'm doing is I'm trampling all over their rights to be treated with respect, even though I'm protecting my own rights. That makes sense. On the other hand, if the person interrupted you mid sentence and you're acting passively, then what you would do, of course, is just allow them to interrupt you. You would finish mid sentence and you would allow them to get on and dictate the conversation. In other words, I'm basically saying you have more rights than I have. So you, can you see the difference between the three? Yeah. So now we're not smart enough, any of us, uh, to sit there and to work all these things out at the time. But on reflection, we can consider them. And so what I'm going to want you to encourage you to do today out of today's session is to practice this assertion, whereas I practice my rights to be heard and my rights to have a point of view my rights to disagree with someone, my rights to be wrong, my rights to be right. All of these things are your rights and you can protect those. On the other hand, the other person has um, rights as well and we need to protect those. I have to tell you a funny, amusing example that um, several months ago when I moved into a new house, um, I wanted to get my electricity on, of course, as you normally do. And unfortunately, there was a delay, which wasn't good, as you can imagine. And what was interesting is I was on the phone to the person and I was a little upset. And I tried to keep my cool, I tried to act assertively, but nevertheless, I, I definitely was, you know, I certainly wanted my electricity on the moment we moved into the house, but it, that wasn't going to happen. And what was interesting is that the person I was speaking to said to me on the phone, you should have, I think it was, you should have called us or something, you know, you should have called us earlier, essentially was probably the message that she was getting across to me. And so what, of course, she was trying to do is to make me feel guilty that really had I done something that she said I should have done, then what would happen is that the problem wouldn't have arisen. In other words, she's pushing the blame onto me. You, we get this all the time. And I fortunately was quite alert to this. 
And as soon as she said to me, you should have called earlier, I said to her, and I did said it respectfully, but I said, how can I should have called you earlier now? Let me just say that again. I said, and of course, that's what she said. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, how can I possibly have called, should have called you now when it's when the past's gone? You see what I'm doing? In other words, she's trying to say, you should have done this. Well, I can't have done at the right here, right now on the phone. I can't go back in time and should have done whatever. So I wasn't going to allow her to make me feel guilty about something that she thinks that I should have done. You see how that happens? People do that all the time. And you should have called me earlier. Well, how can I should have called you earlier now? <laughs> now, I wasn't being rude. I just was pointing out something. And then she said, oh, I see what you mean. I said, exactly. I can't go back in time. I need to have my electricity put on the house, please, as soon as possible. When can you fix it? Which was my retort. That's perfectly okay. It's being assertive. I wasn't being aggressive. Basically, my only objective was to get the electricity put on. And by doing that, um, that's how I approach it. Interestingly enough, by me being assertive like that, this person started to treat me with a lot of respect because you could see I wasn't going to back down. But on the other hand, I certainly wasn't going to be rude and I wasn't going to be obnoxious. So I, she sensed, of course, that I was respecting her rights, but I was also, of course, respecting my rights to have the electricity on as soon as possible. So sometimes this isn't easy in the spare of the moment, of course, but you take that deep breath. Remember the last time we talked, you take the deep breath so that you can just calm yourself a little bit and center yourself and not allow what we might call an amygdala hijack, whereas, you know, that primitive part of your brain gets hijacked where you start thinking, do I run away or do I fight? And that's important. So that's a little definition of assertion. What questions would you like to ask me at this point about that? It sounds easy in theory, doesn't it? <laughs> I think, Tim, a lot of times people just don't realise um, that that's what they're being, that somebody else is being assertive. Um, they instantly just think everyone's aggressive towards them. And if yeah. you're in a bad spot, you can actually, you know, like, you're tired and just not having a good day and then somebody comes in, sometimes you can mistake your assertiveness to be aggression, is what I've found. Yes, yes, you're I right, know. you're right, Kayleen. There's no, sorry to interrupt you, there's no, uh, there's no sort of, I mean, just because you act assertively doesn't mean the other person will automatically recognise that but there's a much better chance of you getting your needs met when you act appropriately. And all we're saying is it's nothing perfect because if someone's had a hard day, a bad day and all the rest of it, it really wouldn't matter what you said at the end of the day because they're just not gonna be happy with you. But the interesting thing is if you act passively, they can be annoyed with you as well because they can say, oh, that person doesn't stand up for their own rights. I wish they would. I wish they'd say what they meant. So you could get into trouble for doing that. And of course, if you get aggressive, you can get into trouble for that as well. So nothing's perfect. And it really does depend very much on how the other person perceives you at the time. And a lot's got to do with how they're feeling, who you are, what your relationship is with them, all of these factors make a big, big difference. I often hear in HR, for example, when people are actually being reasonable and giving people constructive feedback, they will often run to HR and accuse the person of bullying, which, you know, is sort of what you're talking about. That's just, and of course, any smart person in HR is not going to just accept that label. They're going to look into it. 
And if they look into it and they realise that the other person was simply stating some constructive criticism and doing it in an appropriate way, then obviously they weren't being bullied. They weren't bullying. They were just being, they were do, doing what they get paid to do, which is ultimately to lead or manage, you know, the team members. So yeah, you're right. It's a good point you make. People say these things and think these things all the time, but your chances of getting your needs met are much more likely when you're in that middle space between the two is essentially what I, the point I'd make. And, uh, and so the more you can act assertively, the more people will respect you. And the less likely it is that people will misunderstand what you're doing and what you're saying, but always there'll be people who are unreasonable. And sometimes in, they'll just do it because, you know, they don't like you or, you know, they don't like the circumstances or they don't like the fact that you've stood up to them. There's always that possibility. So unfortunately, it's not a perfect world because, but, you know, the other thing that's interesting about assertion is when you act assertively, your self-esteem goes up. So you, you actually walk away from the encounter feeling better about yourself, even if you don't get exactly what you want out of it, you, you will feel better about yourself because you'll know in your heart of hearts, you've treated that person with reasonable respect at the same time, treating yourself with reasonable respect. You see, so it's, it's, it, you, now when you, when you act passively, your self-esteem goes down. And the reason for that, of course, is that you feel horrible about yourself because you think I really should have stood up for myself in that conversation. You know, I should have said this, or I should have said that. So you don't necessarily feel good about that, but interestingly enough, when you act aggressively, sometimes after a while, you might think, well, I probably, you, you may not admit it to anybody, but you may think to yourself, I probably went overboard there. Or I, I probably could have dealt with that a little bit better. So the interesting thing is if you're looking at maintaining high self-esteem, then assertion or assertive communication has a lot to do with that. Yeah. Any, any other questions at this stage? All right. Now, the, just answer these questions in your own mind as we go, because here's a little test just to see how, I mean, it's not the definitive test or anything like that, but here's a couple of, here's five things. Can you express negative feelings about other people and their behaviour without using abusive language? This is part of being, so in other words, if somebody has done the wrong thing by you, Perhaps you don't even like them, but they've done the wrong thing by you. Would you be able to, or can you actually express your dissatisfaction with that without getting hostile and angry and upset? That's a sign of assertion. It's not an easy thing to do, particularly if you don't like the person and you feel very affronted by what they said or what they did. That's one little test. Another one is, can you accept criticism without getting defensive? Now, that's an interesting one. I find a lot of people have trouble with that. So if somebody gives you criticism, is it possible for you to at least take it on board? So in other words, if someone sort of criticised you, could you say to the other person something along the lines of, uh, leave it with me. I want to give that some thought and consideration. I need to process it. Now, that's not a bad answer because you're not getting defensive. You're creating a distance between what the person said and how you might react to it. And it gives you that time and space to perhaps act accordingly. Now, of course, if it's completely unjustified criticism, you're, of course, within your rights to say something like you're entitled to your opinion, but I disagree with you. And then cite an example where, you know, to back up your disagreement. That's a perfectly valid way of dealing with it. 
But getting defensive would be where you start defending yourself and start getting upset and 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 really the other person is just trying, well, the other person may just be trying to help and give you some assistance. Number three, are you able to stand up for your rights? And this is a particularly important one dealing with senior people in your organisation, people in the hierarchy. So if somebody in more senior than you puts you down, um, it's perfectly reasonable for you to appropriately stand up for yourself. Now, would the other person like that? May not. Uh, but of course, what are your options? Act passively, in other words, just accept it. Does that mean the person will appreciate? They'll probably, interesting enough, probably not respect you any more and sometimes less. Or the other possibility is to be quite hostile and aggressive back to them. Well, that's not going to work. So standing up for your own rights is extremely important and be able to do it in a firm way. So for example, if someone asks you to stay back to finish your report and you have, um, it, it happens to be your wedding anniversary or you know, there's some, you know, you've got something on that evening and they've asked you to stay back and they asked, they've asked you to stay back at about three o'clock in the afternoon. So you don't have much time to spend. You would have a perfect right to say to that manager, look, I've already got something organised. I realise perhaps it's inconvenient for you, but I've already got something organised for this evening, so I can't help. Now, that would be a fair and reasonable way because, of course, you have. You've organised something. They may not like that, but then again, they haven't exactly been respectful of your rights either because they've asked you at three o'clock in the afternoon rather than giving you a couple of days notice or something like that where you may have been able to assist. So that's important. Number four, are you able to refuse unreasonable requests from friends, families and co-workers? Interestingly enough, some people find it harder to be assertive with their friends and family than they are with their work colleagues or vice versa. So you might want to think about that and think, well, where do I have trouble refusing? Now, you can see that the key word here is unreasonable requests. Now, unreasonable means unreasonable. In other words, it's not reasonable for you to, to, you know, to deal with that. Number five, do you have the confidence to ask for what you rightfully, what's rightfully yours? So this is the assertion around asking for favours or asking for things that you need from other people, particularly managers. Now, would, would any of you like to talk about any of those five in relation to your own development and which of those five perhaps do you find the most challenging? Because we normally do find one of those five the most challenging. Any comment there? Yeah, Ms. Kayleen, um, I find the one, are you able to stand up for your rights? I, I um, find that I re-examine things later on and quite often I'm so in the moment I don't realise that I need to stand up for myself. Um, and it's later on, it's okay to think about it later on, but it's too late, it's past, the boat's past. So that's the one where I find um, do I stand on someone's toes by standing up or am I just not in the mode, you know? Um, yeah. That's my that's my crutch, that one. Um, yeah. well, let's talk about it. You're right, it's very hard to go back later on. I agree with you. It takes some courage to do that. You can, of course, still do that. You know, you could say, well, look, I probably spoke, I did speak too soon. And I thought about what you've said. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't think it's a reasonable, I don't think it's real, whatever. Now, what's happening with you is when people are doing that, you're having what's called an amygdala hijack. So 
instantly what's happening is your brain is processing, should I run away from this or should I fight it? And in your case, you're running away from it. In other words, you're taking a default position that it's okay to, to walk on my rights at this point. So what I think you should do, and it's no great words that you should use, what you've just got to do is as soon as you feel that happening, take a deep breath. And as you take a deep breath, you are disengaging the amygdala. You are not allowing that to kick in because the reason why you're rational later on about that is that you, your brain is working perfectly fine later on and you realise that they have trampled on your rights. But at the moment, of course, you, you're just seeing it as a flight or fight moment. Mm -hmm. And of course, you're deciding to fly rather than fight. So just try to take that momentary pause and then be prepared to, and then of course, if you take that momentary pause, you're still feeling the, but you'll still feel the butterflies in the stomach, but you might feel a little bit more comfortable to say something at the moment. That's what, that's the way to deal with it. Okay. Now, you. sometimes you won't, but at least, you know, you should. Yeah. So at least you're moving in the right direction because before you've just, you know, you've done whatever you, whatever they said. And then later on, you realize it was wrong. At least if you do that, you'll know that you should have said something. So you're in a better position because you've got your brain working perfectly rationally at the time. It's very common what you're mentioning. Very, very common. And you've got to take the deep breath to allow your brain to disengage the amygdala, which is the primitive part of the brain that processes this material. So hopefully that might help. What about the others? Is there any there that you might have difficulty with apart from that one? Tim, I do have a sort of I don't know, maybe it's a question or something, but can you accept criticism without being defensive? Um, it's kind of like, you know, the saying goes, um, you got to take um, good criticism on board. Yeah. Um, I think a lot, a lot of these things that I'm sort of looking at, um, I think what, what I sort of, what I'm sort of saying is like, I think it's to do with maybe tone, the way a person is, standing you, you know the personality of the person whether they're sort of coming at you um you know like if you've got someone who's sitting down and saying look um i'm telling you this if you're going into a hr and saying look um there's been a bit of an issue i'm sort of telling you as a friend as well as you know from a hr point of view that you know you're sort of slipping a bit behind here yeah. um you know can you, you you know with the tone of everything where if you've got someone who says you know you go in there and says well listen We've got problems with you, blah, blah, blah. You, you know, I think it's all to do with the stance of a person, the tone of things and how people sort of take that in. I think looking at a lot of this, what I've noticed is it's it's basically, you know, the space between people, you know, the distance where you have your boundaries, you know, um, what you feed off that person, you know, all in the tone, the way they look the stance and so forth. Yes. I think that comes into play a fair bit of this because you can take criticism, but I think for me, it depends how you speak. If you're going to speak aggressive, well, then I'm going to take that. Um, I'm going to be defensive. But if you say, well, listen, um, you know, just like a normal conversation, well, I'm going to say, all right, well, I'll, I'll take that on board. Like I, I appreciate what you're saying yep. and, yep. you know, take it away as a learning curve. That's how I sort of look at it. Like, no, that's, that's, I'm glad you raised it, Danny, because the, all of those things do come into play and also your feeling at the time. I mean, if you're a bit run down or a bit feeling a bit vulnerable or all of that has to be taken into account. When we're dealing with these things, there's two dimensions. There's who the other person is. And the other dimension is what it is all about. And so sometimes we find it hard to be assertive with some people 
regardless of how they might be acting at the time. It might be their seniority or, you know, we, or we just, they, we find them intimidating or what, what, whatever it might be. So you've got to really, you've got to really force yourself to take that deep breath and realize that, uh, you know, you've got to, in other words, try, you've got to try and separate what's being said with, oh, or, and of course, how they say it, you've got to separate those things. Now, um, I'm not saying any of this is easy. And, and I reckon if you get, you know, a one out of four, whereas you had zero out of four, you're moving in the right direction. And it does, you're right. So I totally respect what you're saying. I just, I think that the principles are the same though, that you have no right to be spoken to in a derogatory, negative, undermining way. And some people have actually made that an art form and they've gone through their whole life intimidating people. And I'll tell you something very interesting about that. And these are what we might call bullies, you know, they go around and intimidate people. And I'm sure in local governments, you've got them as you have in every other industry. So the interesting thing is that when you stand up to a bully, when I say stand up, I don't mean being aggressive, but just doing what we're suggesting, assertive. They don't know how to take that. It's a real shock because they're not used to somebody doing that. And this is just an insight for you. So in other words, if I stand up to someone that's normally quite aggressive to me, it won't always create more aggression. Sometimes it will, but often they'll be taken aback because they're just not used to someone being assertive when they're dealing with them. So that's just a little insight for you. And I think that you can separate the criticism from perhaps the way people are speaking to you. So if they're raising their voice or whatever, then you can say, look, I'm happy to take on board the criticism, but I don't appreciate the way you're, you know, the way you're sharing it. Um, so, you know, I mean, I know it's easy to think about that after the event, but I think that, you know, you can try to separate those things. One of the best techniques that I think you can try when you're put in these positions is ask them a question. Now, when you ask someone a question, you are buying yourself space and time to think about how to react. It's a bit like the deep breath. So for example, you might say to someone, can you give me an example? Or can you explain to me in a bit more detail what you mean? Now you can do that. And when you, while, you're, while they're responding to that question, your brain will start to kick in and think, now is this, be, is this person being reasonable or are they not? You can do an evaluation of them. Of them. So in other words, I can come back later and say what I may have been able to say in that split moment, but often don't because I've been intimidated by the person. Does that, does that help? Ask them a question, ask them a question, put them on the back foot. Can you give me an example? Can you explain when you saw this? What incident did you mean? When did it happen? How did it happen? what happened so all of these allow the other person so because you have a right to, i suppose this, the idea of that is that you have a right to be completely understanding of what they're telling you i mean if you're not sure then you have a right to know and sometimes the other person may not be very clear about how they explain it anyway so you need to ask that question in order to el elicit a full response to that. But the, the byproduct of all of that is that you get more time to think about how you should react about that in the first place. So try that one. Okay. So um, I agree. It depends on who's saying it. It depends on where you are. It depends on how you're feeling. It depends on a lot of things. 
But that's why I'm saying that if you think about it, it's impossible to be assertive all the time. It's impossible. 10 out of 10 encounters, you won't be. But if you can increase your assertion, then you're going to be far more respected by everyone, including yourself. So the whole idea is to try to find opportunities to act assertively when perhaps initially you might default to being passive or aggressive, if that makes sense. So it's a really important lesson to learn, if you like, to be able to put yourself into that position. That makes sense. All right, let's have a look at some other, why is it important? I think I've probably covered a lot of this. Obviously, it's important because you get your needs met, you get your goals met and all the rest of it. And that's why assertion also increase your ability to maintain your own personal dignity and your own rights as well. So that's important to do that as well. Okay. So there's a couple of myths about this that I wanted to discuss with you before we move on. Other people's feelings and rights are more important than yours. No, they're not. Nobody on the planet Earth has more, uh, more rights than you do in this regard. So if you have been brought up with this notion that other people have got more rights than you, then you need to really question that because it's not true. You have no more rights than anybody else and nobody else has any more rights than you in these fundamental things that we're talking about. Now, you might say, what about a leader? Well, a leader in the same way, they have no more rights than you in terms of dignity and all of those things. Certainly they have more responsibilities and certainly they can suggest certain things, but they don't necessarily have more rights than you, if that makes sense. That's one myth I want you to have a think about. Another myth is that you can, you will offend other people by being assertive. The fact of the matter is um, you, you may at times, but the point is that's not a reason to allow people to walk all over you. So it's, you know, so yes, it's, it's possible that you will, but the chances are you probably won't because it's the, it's the least uh, offensive of the three, passive, aggressive, and assertion. You are not important enough to express your feelings and rights. Yes, you are. You are important enough to. And we've all got to remind ourselves of that. Me too, you, everybody, we have all, we're all important enough to do that. And in fact, interesting enough, if we don't stand up for our own rights, then who's going to do that for us? there's a reasonable chance that no one will. And if no one will, then we're allowing ourselves to be walked all over and that's not reasonable. So I just want, I think part of the whole deal here is not just to use fancy words and take deep breaths and all the rest of it. It's also to look at yourself and try and think, is, is what Tim's actually saying true? Is this, you know, what are the, some of the beliefs that I hold so, for example, I was brought up with the view that we're supposed to be respectful to uh, people in positions of authority. Mm. Now, I, I don't think that's an unreasonable thing to be brought up with. But if I hold on to that for too much, then I'm going to allow people in positions of authority to be able to overreach their rights because I might think that they have more rights than me because I've been told that people in positions of authority have, you know, we should be respectful. You see how these things can get twisted. And we've all been brought up with these beliefs and we carry them around with us. And often what it does is it stops us being assertive when we need to. So some food for thought there. The things that keep us fearful or keep us away from acting assertively is the fear of change, you know, to be able to change my own way of doing things. Uh, a refusal to admit submission, you know, this is a fear, a fear of ruining relationships. Can I tell you this, that in your relationships, your working relationships, or even your personal relationships, if by acting assertively, you are actually going to destroy the relationship, then guess what? The relationship's not in very good, very good uh, repair. It's not in good, 
is not in a good position. By you respecting their rights and your rights and standing up for yourself, if you do that and the relationship is actually going to be ruined, then what does it say about the relationship? It obviously means that you're in a submissive role with that person and that's not an ideal relationship. So you need to think about that one. And of course, if you feel that you lack the confidence, I don't, I'm not sure that it's necessarily a confidence thing because all of us at times can act assertively. So for example, with our children, or it might be with our loved ones or whoever it might be, we are all capable of acting assertively in different situations and different circumstances as Danny alluded to before in the sense that, you know, it depends on the situation and where I'm at. So we've all got the ability to do that. And, and, uh, and I would have to also say that acting assertively actually makes you, gives you more confidence as well. Anything, any questions there folks? So here's a couple of things that I want you to think about in relation to the topic that we're covering today. You have the right to be assertive. No matter what you think, you do have that right. You have the right to request that other people change their behavior if it is infringing on your rights. You absolutely do. You have a right to express your needs, even if they are illogical. Right. So if you've got a need and maybe you haven't expressed it the way you should, you still have that right to express that need. Just because the other person doesn't understand it doesn't lessen your right to assert that need. So be aware, of course, as I said at the bottom here, that every right has a responsibility as well. So this is not about people running around asserting their rights and at the same time not taking responsibility for their behaviours with other people. As I say, assertion is I have rights, you have rights. And so that's very important to think of it that way. So here's a situation. I want you to tell me how you'd respond to it. Jones at a meeting. Jones at a meeting uh, where a topic uh, is, let me just move that so I can read it. Right, Jones at a meeting where a topic is viable for a project, all right? She, she's been working on it for three months straight. She has not said a word in the last hour. Suddenly, she jumps up and accuses you of cancelling the project based on personal dislike. So in other words, she's upset. She hasn't said anything for an hour. She's upset and she's taking it personally. How do you respond to Joan? So if you're in that meeting and you've got the luxury now of not actually being in that meeting, how might you respond to Joan at the meeting? Any thoughts? Being assertive, of course. Yes, I think I would say, hey, Joan, where is this coming from? Um, we're here to discuss this problem and um, you haven't contributed in any way. We'd like to hear from you. Um, what is it that you might like to take the floor now and, and tell us what how this is going with this project? Because I know you've been working hard on it. But um, just, just go slow, take your time and tell us what's exactly going on here. Love it. That's very good. I, you know, that's exactly right. Yeah, and there's a number of different things you could do here. One is you could say that, first of all, let me correct you. This is not a personal dislike. This is really looking at the project and I don't want you to think that it's a personal dislike. It has nothing to do with that. So, because you have a right, because what she's trying to do is to say it's personal. And I think if you accept that, then you put yourself in a position where she's attacked you basically 
and she, all you're doing is looking at it objectively. So I'd probably want to correct her on that. And I like your idea, Narell, of actually saying, where's this coming from? So you're giving yourself a chance to respond. And the fact that you also said to her that, you know, you've had an hour or, you know, you've had the whole meeting and we haven't heard anything from you. And so we, we, we're not mind readers. We can't work out, you know, whether you're for it or, you know, how you feel about it because we haven't heard anything. So I could probably say that and be, to be fair to her. But I think the point I'd want to make is that, you know, I reinforced my point about, you know, the fact that it's not personal. This is just a pretty much a business decision. What about this one? Let's try the next one. Now, the copier, the photocopier has broken down for two days and Sam's asked the administrative assistant to call in for repairs several times with no effect. He says nothing and calls the, repairman, the repairer himself. So obviously the admin person hasn't done their job. Sam ends up calling the repairer. After all, he thinks she's probably too busy typing up the report he gave her at the meeting. How does Sam approach the admin assistant? So Sam's got Sam's asked for something to be done. It's obviously not done. He's rationalised that maybe she's got busy doing something else and that I'll go and do it anyway. What could Sam possibly say to that person at that stage? Now, of course, he could say nothing, and a lot of people might do that and just walk off in a half. What do you think he could do at that stage? It doesn't say on here that um, the admin assistant might have called the repairer and the repairer hasn't come. We know what repairers are like. And it doesn't say that after he, he rang that the repair is going to come anyway. You know, this is what's wrong with a lot of these people. They just don't come when you ask them to. I think the things to blaming the admin assistant, but it might not be their fault at all. It could be the other people at the other end have been too busy. So in other words, perhaps we might go, not go in all guns blazing and attack the, uh, attack the uh, admin assistant uh, we perhaps we should try and investigate and find out whether there's a valid reason for the photocopy not being fixed. So we might start with a question. Um, you know, I asked you a couple of days ago to organise to get the photocopy fixed. I noticed it's not fixed. What seems to be the problem? All right, because you did have that conversation with her. You're not attacking her. You're actually asking what was the problem. So you're giving that person an opportunity to, because it could well be something that we don't know. So if I just go in and attack her or attack the admin assistant, that's probably not fair on that person because just because I think that that person hasn't made an, an attempt, whether they have or not, I haven't found that out. So you're perfectly right. That's balancing their rights with your rights. Any other comments about that one? Do you think it's reasonable to say something to the admin assistant at the at the end of this, or just ignore it? I think you have to go and just find out the situation. Yes. Have they ignored me, or have they been trying and doing it in between all the stuff? What is the reason? Like to just go and do it yourself? Or, yeah. You know, I'd rather go and say, "Hey, I know I've asked, and just." Checking, has the, have you had a chance to do it? Um, and then find out what their work like. You know, there's always two sides to every story. And always when something's broken, this is me. Jay Khan, our photocopier breaks all the time. Danny will burn this. Um, and I want it fixed immediately because I'm like, I just, I hate Jay Khan. Um, so this situation to me is actually a live situation. Right. And I've gone to admin, like, choose the girls and said, Okay, I know I've asked. I've asked a couple of times, but have we had any response or have we had a chance to do this? And then gone from there. Rather than just going and doing it and 
that doesn't that defeats the purpose. Yeah, good. Now, you know, if if for example, the admin person said to me, um, I was too busy doing the report and I didn't do anything about it. So they're being honest. You say, well, I appreciate your honesty, but the reality is I would have preferred to have known that earlier on, or I would have preferred you to have let me know. Um, because if you'd done that, then I could have made alternative plans. I was working on the assumption that you were going to go ahead and do it because I hadn't heard anything different. Perfectly okay to say that because you're working on a false assumption and that person could have come to you. So look, it's an interesting one. What about this one? Judy's boss asks her to go on an important business trip, which will carry over into the weekend of her sister's wedding. Judy feels that she can't refuse her boss and plans to spend, plans on spending her, uh, sending her spouse to the wedding in her place. How does Judy approach a manager? So this is difficult because it's a um, power relationship. What do you think you might do to approach your manager in this circumstance? Personally, I would um, say thank you for the honour of attending the business trip and I really would like to do it. Um, I just need, is it possible for somebody else to go as it's my sister's wedding? Because honestly, as a boss, you don't know what the social life is and all of that um, and you would rearrange it. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, the, only, the only thing I'd say about that is that I'd probably be firmer about... Um, is it possible to find someone else? Because you're you're almost if they if they if they push you a little bit harder, they might make you feel guilty and you might yeah. drop everything. So yeah. you probably say you'll need to find someone else because I've organised an alternative arrangement. You know some you know you need to be firm about it because otherwise. And I love what you said about thank you for the honour. So you really starting off on a very positive note, you're letting the person know that it's perfectly okay. You know, I've really appreciated it. It's just, I can't do it. Yeah. I've got another arrangement. And, and I think if you say that people will, if they're being reasonable, will completely understand that. All right. So I think we're just about, oh, I was just going to talk about the SBI model before I finish. And I think this is a very good one just to, I'll obviously send you the slides and the recording at the end of this, but SBI stands for situation, beliefs, situation, behavior, and impact. So what you do is when you've got to give somebody some feedback, you explain the situation, you explain the behavior, and you explain the impact. So for example, if I said in the meeting with Joe yesterday in the kitchen this morning, when we were discussing X or in the meeting with Mary on Friday. So I explain, it's very simple. I just explain the, you know, the, the context. So in other words, the person knows what I'm talking about straight away. Then I might say, you interrupted, or perhaps I might say, you did not complete your assignment on time or you arrived late. What I'm doing there is I'm separating the person from the behavior. I'm talking about the behavior. And then not to be underestimated, it's important then to describe the impact that's had. So I might say something uh, such as uh, the impact, of course, this is the impact on you or your co-workers or whatever. So you might say, look, you, because you kept interrupting my team members in the meeting, they all shut down and didn't want to have a chance to discuss the ideas of others. So it's important to explain the impact because sometimes the person who's been the offender actually doesn't understand or appreciate the impact that that behaviour has had on other people, including yourself. So it's perfectly reasonable for you to explain the impact. And that also justifies why you're talking about this. So all you've got to do is remember SBI, situation, behaviour, and impact. So just something for a little bit of homework to think about. So look, I just want you to go away, practice, 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 try things out, feel comfortable talking to me 
um, at the next session next year and say, look, I had this happen and what can I do about it? Or I was very happy with the way I managed this. That was the other side of it. Be prepared to share your examples. But um, so that's it, folks. So with, next time we meet, it'll be in the new year. It's been a terrible year, hasn't it, for everybody? I'm, I'm hoping 2021 is a better year. I'm sure you are too. So fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to a better year because it's been a shocker for all of us. So um, thanks, everyone. Enjoyed working with you this year. And um, we'll, we'll, the next time we meet, we'll talk about some of these communication skills that, that, that we'll talk about as to how I might say something or how I can approach a certain situation in Unit 5. I don't know the date of that, but I'm assuming it's sometime in January. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Tim. And Merry Christmas. And yeah. Happy New Year. And let's get rid of 2020 and get into 2021. <laughs> You're not wrong there. Yeah, oh. yeah. So Merry Christmas to you all and and uh, have a safe and, and ha hopefully if you have a nice break too because we all deserve it. So thanks, everyone. Well Catch thank you, you Tim. Cheers. See ya. Bye. Bye.